come back. Sorry. <laughs> Let's... Sorry, love. Everybody, I'll be with you shortly. <laughs> right. So just a few little notes about joining in this evening. We're hoping that it will be an informal and participative evening um, and perhaps a little bit different from some of our webinars. It's a very special, special evening, a special story we're going to hear from Jo. Um, and we, yeah, we plan to have plenty of time to listen to and reflect on Jo's story and how it, indeed it's inspired people all over the world in many conflict zones. Um, please do feel free to share your thoughts. You can use the chat section at the bottom of the Zoom screen at any time. Um, you can post comments there or links that you'd like to share. And you're also very welcome to type in questions there for Joe. Um, and Jonathan, my colleague, will be sort of collating them. Alternatively, you're also very welcome to ask your questions in person, um, live on the video. You can do this by waving your hand. There's also a technological waving hand function, which I'm not sure I've totally ever got to grips with. Um, it's under the list of participants at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And Joe or Jonathan will then invite you to speak. Um, so I'm going to be speaking just for a little bit of introductory comments. And then Joe will speak for a, about 20 minutes. And as I say, there'll be plenty of time for yeah, reflection or quiet and comments and questions and, and discussion. Um, and just a little reminder that we are recording live um, on Facebook and we'll be recording a copy to use on YouTube as well um, on other social media later. This is Conscience, Taxes for Peace Not War, for those of us who perhaps not come across us before. Um, we campaign for a change in the law so that individuals can opt for the military part of their taxes to go to peaceful purposes instead. Big aim. Um, you may know that the right to conscientiously object to serving in the military um, was introduced in the UK in 1916. A while ago, so no physical conscription in the UK today. However, we are each forced to pay for the military through our taxes. Um, so that's something we regard as financial conscription, modern day form. And we've been doing a, a series of webinars, first of all, looking at the, the general principle of conscientious objection to military service, looking a little bit about the history, first in the First World War, and then the Second World War. And also in our fourth webinar, we looked at current day experiences of conscientious objection to military service in a number of different countries. And then last time we shifted focus a little bit from conscientious objection to military service to conscientious objection to military taxation, core, core part of conscience's work. And we looked at the history of conscientious objection to military taxation through the years. Um, and all, the, all those webinars, you can, if you're interested in any of them, there's um, full recordings of them on our website. Um, on Conscience webinars is the page. So since we started, we started as the peace tax campaign, we've been very persistent in introducing bills to try and achieve a peace tax um, through, through Parliament. Those are the names of some of the ones that were introduced over the years. And at the moment, we're preparing to introduce a new one um, sometime in the 2022-2023 parliamentary session. So we're beginning to look at the wording um, uh, of the last one, <laughs> revisiting that one. That was 2016. Ruth Cadbury introduced um, on our behalf. And I've just drawn out here, I'm not expecting people to read all this, but I've just drawn out um, a couple of sort of key sections from the bill. Um, one on a statement of conscientious objection, defining what an objector 
is or would be in under this new legislation um, a person liable to income tax who objects to expenditure of tax revenues on military activity on the ground that such expenditure is incompatible with his or her or conviction that person's an They'd make a statement under this section to be known as a statement of conscience objection. When the Inland Revenue received that statement um, in any financial year, they must arrange for the relevant proportion of the income tax the objector is liable to be applied in accordance with section two, which we would know as the peace tax. So that's a sort of just little definitions. And again, from the two 2016 um, bill that we put forward, was what we said at that time about the allocation of such a peace tax to non-military security, thinking about how, how it might be spent. Um, and it says the peace tax raised from objectors shall be allocated to expenditure on non-military security. And there was a definition of that here, saying the promotion of security through international understanding, reconciliation, and Pacific settlement of disputes. Blue, because that particularly pertains to sort of Joe's talk today. But I think Joe's, Joe's talk will cover some of the other areas here too. Um, the removal of causes of conflict, um, the conversion of industrial production from military to non-military purposes, the resolution of inter international disputes through mediation, and other peaceful and non-military methods of avoiding or resolving violence wide. That was, that was our wording then. I've got one more slide, which is full of words. <laughs> but again, we don't need to read this. I think, I think this is sort of taking a little bit of a step back from the last one. This is actually what the government um, assessed as the top tier one risks that we as a country face over the next year, so five years. So that was done in 2015. Um, so way, yeah, way before the pandemic. It's, it's, yeah, it's interesting and sobering sort of looking back on what, what the five top risks were defined as then by the government. And number one we've got here is as terrorism, which I would, painfully and uh, movingly be talking about later on um, thank you and then we've got cyber warfare we've got international military conflict which i suppose is what we, we generally think of as the military section of our taxes going towards um, we've got instability overseas public health who would have known that that would sort of zoom up in the way it has and major nat natural hazards, severe weather and flooding. So those massive, yeah, those were the, just sort of revisiting that really and, and thinking about for an, um, a new peace tax bill and new peace tax fund that comes from that, how would, how would we relate those to those, those risks, whether they, they'd be the same one today. And just a few more, this, the, the next few slides are images, no, no more thick writing ones. Um, I just had a little thought, think before, before the webinar tonight about what reconciliation means to me. And it came, it came up to me in images really. Um, people probably recognize this is the um, cathedral at Coventry, the original old one, which was bombed during the second world war and a decision made to, to leave it. In its, in its bombed out state, a place um, to remember. And, and the cathedral's become a, a real center for reconciliation. And this, this is Cologne in Germany, 1945, after the Allied bombings. And I, I put this image up there, because, um, Partly because a family, a family story, um, 
my father was a conscientious objector after the military service, well, it wasn't to military service, to national service after the Second World War. And as part of his alternative service, he and my mum were um, youth club leaders with the Quakers in the East End of London. And so this was not that long after the war and they were invited um, with other young people um, to go to Cologne. They spent time in Cologne meeting young, young Germans. And my mum my has this memory of, of going around in a scooter um, in the evening and just seeing devastation. Um, yeah, she's 86 now, but she remembers it um, vividly and had enormous impact on her. But it's sort of, yeah, the work of reconciliation, people, people from those two, two warring countries, young people particularly coming together. Is um, a sculpture um, that was first. Um, the original is in Bradford University, um, and yeah, the, it's a moving um, statement from the sculptor. Sculptor. The sculpture was originally conceived in the aftermath of the war. Europe was in shock. People were stunned. I read in the newspaper about a woman who crossed Europe on foot to find her husband. And I was so moved that I made the sculpture. Then I thought that it wasn't only about the reunion of two people, but hopefully a reunion of nations which have been fighting. And bronze casts of the original sculpture have, have been made. And there's now the same sculpture in Coventry Cathedral, um, in Hiroshima Peace Park in Japan, in Stormont Estate in Belfast, and also as part of the Berlin Wall Memorial. The other image that came to me um, this afternoon was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. I remember that. Um, remember, yeah. Being very moved at the time about the process they went through. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was a court-like restorative justice body assembled in South Africa after the end of apartheid. Witnesses who were identified as victims of gross human rights violations were invited to give statements of experience and some were selected for public hearings. Perpetrators of violence would also give testimony and request amnesty from both civil and criminal prosecution. Mm. Oh, to Joe. <laughs> I've deliberately not, not included the details of Joe's story because I, I want you to hear it in her words very much so. Um, Joe's the founder of the charity Building Bridges for Peace. And we'll be putting the details of that in the slides at, at the end of the webinar. Um, Building Bridges for Peace works to enable divided communities and the general public to explore and better understand the roots of war, terrorism and violence. We promote dialogue and mediation as the means to peace. The title of Joe's talk is Reconciliation and Peace Building, Personal Experience of Being Affected and Becoming a Peace Thank you so much, Joe, for joining us. We're so, we're so happy to have you, honoured to have you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for asking me. And um, oh, it's an absolute honour to be connected to the amazing work that you all do. <laughs> um, I've been aware um, probably for quite a few decades, so very, very happy to be here. So yeah, I'd like to share a little of my story and my work, but then very much make it an interactive session because you're all um, passionate about peace as well. Um, and it'd be good also to maybe look at the challenges of being in the UK and being passionate about peace and being peace builders. Um, because let's face it, it's a, it's a difficult time right now in the UK to be a peace builder. 
Um, but I'll start by sharing some of my story and I'll take you right back to the, the Brighton bomb. It's interesting because I, you know, it's, it's history lesson for many of the young people that I work with. Um, but for some of us around at that time, it was the Brighton bomb was seen as the sort of most notorious terrorist attack because um, the British government were nearly all killed. Um, my father was one of the five people who were killed in that bomb and I was 27 and I did not grow up thinking that my father would be at risk of being killed by the IRA. As a teenager, sometimes I couldn't get to school in London, there were bomb scares, but it was just something that happened. And I did live in peacetime, unlike many people who I know in Northern Ireland. Um, it took us about 10 hours to get the news. They found my dad's body and that my stepmother was injured. And I didn't just lose my father in that bomb, who um, he was a Tory MP. And I had a very different lifestyle to the one that perhaps he thought that I was going to have. <laughs> I just spent two years meditating in the Himalayas and very much believing in inner peace. But we were really, really good friends. And he was very understanding of my position on life. Uh, and I absolutely adored him. He was a very, very good man. Um, so I didn't just lose him, but I also lost the, the me that felt like meditation was the answer to great peace because I felt I was part of a war straight away. It's like my heart was open to the reality of, of war and violent conflict. And I couldn't go back to the person that I had been. So two days later, um, I went to a church in London, St. James's Church at that time was very much as a beacon of light. Some of you might, might have known of the amazing work that was done there. And Donald, Re Donald Reeves was the rector and he had a service on. It was actually the, it was the, it was the general, I don't know if you know, the generals for peace, generals for disarmament was speaking, most amazing, um, I think Eileen and I can't remember his name, Hardbottle, I think they were called. Anyway, amazing people. And as I was sitting there listening to them, I made a decision. I'm going to find a way to bring something positive out of what had happened. I'm going to find a way to understand the IRA because I don't want an enemy. And I saw it as a choice. Do I go on the route of revenge? Do I stay a victim? Do I, do I have an enemy or do I find a way to change this around? And this was two days later. And it was a decision that I didn't tell anybody. No one knew. I was so shy that I couldn't even speak to anyone about it. Um, but I felt like I'd made a decision that meant that I was going to be okay. Um, so I was just 27. I had very little emotional intelligence. This is way before Google. Um, but somehow I knew I was going to find a way to bring something positive out of it. And I, and I remembered um, doing some things back, back in 84. There was um, a massive memorial concert for all the people who were bereaved but also all the emergency service in Brighton and the Dean of West, Westminster I think he organized it and and um, Andrew Lloyd Webber put on um, a musical I think I can't remember what it was called in Requiem maybe and I really really wanted to speak about forgiveness I really wanted to have a message there about forgiveness and I was told that that was not appropriate so it was very very hard to get my voice heard at that time and I, as I was not very confident so I didn't know what to do but I was straight away thinking about forgiveness um so but experience happened a few weeks later that gave me a very clear direction I was living in London and going home on the tube and I suddenly decided to leave the tube early and found myself around King's Cross and then thought what am I going to do now missed the last tube, I've got to get home, so I'll get a taxi, and there weren't that many, but there was a young man also looking for a taxi, and we discovered he was going to a similar part of London, so we thought, okay, we'll share it, and I knew from his accent that he came from Northern Ireland, so I said to him, this is a really odd request, but I'm trying to understand why someone would join the IRA, can you help me, and he said, oh no, that's, that's not odd, odd at all, he said, I, I understand, my brother, he was in the IRA um, and he was killed last year by a British soldier. So there we were, this is the height of the conflict. We represented two sides. We represented at that time, you know, we, we, his people, um, he came from IRA communities and my, my community were at that time seeing each other as enemies. 
but we saw each other as brother and sister and we talked about a world where peace was possible where nobody killed where nobody got killed and I remember leaving that taxi and thinking I can build a bridge across the divide and even though no one knows because no one did know I know and it gave me a sense of something that I could do I could meet someone who represented my other and see them in their full humanity and a few months after that I had a possibility to go to Northern Ireland to do a workshop with an amazing woman called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and after that workshop I didn't go home instead the amazing people in Northern Ireland took me to their houses and got me to meet people. So this is 85. And I went to houses where, like safe houses for Catholics and Protestants to meet. Um, I walked around West Belfast, which at that time for an English person, you know, like it was, you know, it was a, it was a risk. But it gave me a sense of just seeing the British army on the streets, seeing I was checked by every time we went to a shop. It was it was a war zone. It was so different from London. And I even met someone very high up in Sinn Féin. And we had to meet in hiding. Like he couldn't be seen to meet me because um, I think he, whether I would have been at risk or him, I don't know. But that was that was the level of the of just the, the fear at that time. And I met him because um Someone had asked me to write down what I thought about what was about my own thoughts on forgiveness. And she'd photocopied it and she sent it round. And so this person, the Sinn Fein, he'd received it. And he wanted to write, he wanted to meet me for, for me to understand a bit more about the IRA and the Sinn Fein position. And all I remember about that meeting was um, he said he'd he'd apologize for the death of my father. But more than that was the relationship he had with his son who was in the room with him, who was incredibly um, special needs and uh, required a lot of attention. And I could see that this man who obviously believed in violence because he'd apologized for my father being killed, but he, he had just so much love. And that was really important for me. I'm not someone who learns by history books or I don't really mind about the history. What, to me, it's about the human face. So it's all about re rehumanizing the other. But I reached a point after two years where I'd done, I'd had no support for my own tra trauma. And I was putting myself, looking back on it, well, I know that I was putting myself at risk. One of my daughters, who later on I took to Belfast, she was told by an ex-IRA combatant, you do realize when your mum was here earlier, <laughs> she she put her own life in danger. And I'm like, don't tell my daughter that, you know, like <laughs> she doesn't need to know. <laughs> Um, but I was so driven, I was so, so driven to find a way, and the newspapers were never going to give me those answers. We know the IRA was so demonised, you couldn't even hear Sinn, Vo Sinn Féin voices, even, even their voices were muted. And then there are many, many years when I didn't go back, and all that time there were bombs going off, as we know, they carried on, there were people being killed, and it didn't matter which side it was, I just felt that pain and wanted to feel like I could contribute. But I felt very alone, very alone with my own journey. And it was only in the peace process, which I was hugely grateful for, that my life changed again. I remember in June 99, so the Good Friday Agreement was, I think it was 98. So one of the stipulations of the Good Friday Agreement was that the political prisoners came out of prison. Um, and it also all the victims were meant to be prepared and supported when this happened. And one day I turn on the TV and it's the BBC six o'clock news, which was on at that time. And there was the headlines, Patrick McGee being released from prison. Now I had no idea he was coming out. Right? And he's the only person who's ever been held responsible for planting the bomb in Brighton. And there he is come out, coming out of prison. I remember scrutinizing his face, looking at him thinking, does he feel remorse? What's he thinking? But he had the world's press there because he was such a notorious ex-prisoner at that point. So he was just whisked away into a car and off he went. And I remember thinking, it's all right for him. He's got the rest of his life back. My dad can't come back. How's that fair? But then I thought, this is for peace. This means less people are going to be killed. So I welcomed this. And then the idea that had been there for a very long time became stronger and stronger. Now he's out of prison, maybe I can meet him. 
And then for the first time, I got invited to victims, survivors groups, where I had an amazing time to release some of the trauma and the pain and meet other people being affected by the troubles on all sides. And we became the most amazing family, connecting with our pain and connecting with our, with just our, our love for life, but also as well as crime, we were laughing and very powerful weekend. And I met people who knew Patrick McGee and I'd heard that when he was in prison, he got a PhD. I heard that since he came out of prison, he was committed to the peace process because not, not all of them were, but he was very committed to the peace process. So the idea became a definite possibility. So three times I asked people, can you, can you arrange for this to happen? And one person was, um, he ran a, a prisoners group. Someone else was a mediator. And I can't remember who the third person was, but like someone else definitely, I was trying to organize and each time I heard back, sorry, Joe, but Patrick McGee doesn't want to meet you. And I knew meeting other men in the IRA that actually he would come out of prison very much feeling that, um, that he had no problems. I was told that by other men in the IRA. The IRA, they feel like they won because they got the political platform they wanted. So I was the one that had the needs. He wouldn't have any needs. And so I thought, well, if he doesn't want to meet me, there's other bridges to build. And I was busy meeting other people like the families of the hunger strikers, because I definitely see a correlation between the, when the hunger strikers weren't listened to by Margaret Thatcher, that definitely would have um, meant the British government more of a target. And there were other people, I met people through from Bloody Sunday, who, who I, I'm still in touch with. It was a time of just meeting many, many people. And who were, I've trusted all this time, and if it's not right, it's not right. And I, I'd written a poem called Bridges Can Be Built, which was about meeting Patrick McGee. And I was asked to share it at a peace conference. And so I went there and there was someone there who said, I know Patrick McGee, which at this point, I'm getting quite used to that happening. <laughs> and he said, I can organize a meeting between you and him. And I was like, okay, please do. And he said, how much time do you need to prepare? I said, oh, give me, give me 24 hours and I'll be here. And what happened was, was a few weeks later, I was preparing to go to Dublin to Glen Cree Reconciliation Centre for one of my victims weekends, which is an amazing place. And just as I was about to think about leaving, the phone rang and it was my friend Anne Gallagher, who's sadly not with us anymore, to say that I've arranged Patrick McGee, he's coming to my house at seven o'clock, can you come? And I remember thinking, not today. I'm not in the mood. I, I'm not feeling visionary or peaceful. I'm just thinking about my little daughters and leaving for the weekend. I can't do this. But then I thought, how could this feel okay? I'm, I'm off to meet the man who killed my father. So I said, yes. And, you know, I, I now do restorative processes, right? This broke every rule. I'm there on my own. I'm on the ferry between Hollyhead and Dublin. And there's no one there. There's just me with all my thoughts in my head terrified how would I feel like sitting with him would I regret it I hadn't told anyone I was doing it so I wasn't carrying my family with me but would I feel like I betrayed my father would I regret it would I get angry would he turn up what would he say and then a big question how would I feel the next day what would happen some very strange thoughts in my head but I was so determined to go that that carried me through all those doubts and I'm in my friend's house and and is she and her family, they're all activists, they're, they're, they're a community activist house, there's people coming and going, this is no safe prepared environment. At one point she even gave me a wooden spoon and said, can you finish cooking? And I'm like, no, I can't cook, <laughs> I'm terrified. And then we ate and then I heard the knock on the door and in walked Patrick McGee. And I, I remember I got up and I, and I shook his hand and said, thank you for coming. And he said, oh, no, no, thank you for inviting me. And I said, oh, I really appreciate that you've changed your mind. Because I've, you know, I've asked a few times. And he said, oh, I have been asked a few times. A daughter, one of my victims from Brighton wanted to meet me. And I've always said, yes. And I now call that our icebreaker because it was suddenly we were talking about something that was a bit safer, which was like, how come his... He said yes, but I heard, I got back a no. And looking back on it, I think it was about either protecting him or me. 
It was so early on in the peace process that I can kind of understand. <laughs> um, so we went into our own room at the back of the house, and this is like a little conservatory with a sofa. And I had some strange thoughts. I remember looking at him and thinking, you don't look like my idea of a terrorist, <laughs> whatever my idea of a terrorist is. And another part of me going, Joe, just go now. You're with the man who killed your father. Go where you can. You shouldn't be here. But more than that, I was present to him. I was so curious. I wanted to, I wanted to see his humanity. I didn't meet him to change him. I didn't meet him to judge him or blame him. I met him to see his humanity because that was going to give me something back. And he started off by giving me some of the justification about the IRA. And I, I knew that. I know I'd heard it before. I was comfortable with it. I could understand it. You know, I could understand it. I knew of the suffering that his community had had, and I knew that it had gone back centuries, and, and I knew the role that the, that the English had played. And I shared my poem to him, and I think that was part of him changing, because there's a line in the poem about, I acknowledge your struggle, and, and I'm, I'm sorry for the part that my community played. And I think I reached a point of realizing that he was someone who, he cared for his community. That's why he joined violence. Now, I'm always going to be true to nonviolence. I have age about 10, I think I first decided I was committed to peace and nonviolence. And 63, I still am. So my thinking has changed a lot over the years. Um, but I could see that for him to choose violence was a response to the suffering that he saw in his community. And it was because he cared, he wanted to protect the people that he loved and he, and he saw so much suffering. And I could understand that, but he was justifying killing my father. And that was, that was difficult also emotionally to hear because for me, the bright and bum was, it still affects my life. You know, I'm still healing, things like that, you know, aren't just easy to get over. But I've, seen some of his humanity that I've got what I want no one will ever know and I, and I never need to see him again so I'm going to go now and that's when he stopped talking and he rubbed his eye and he said I don't know anymore who I am can I hear your pain and your anger I've never met anyone so open and so much dignity as you and I remember that part of me wanted to leave the room as quickly as possible because this was really scary because I knew he'd changed. He'd taken off his political hat and he'd stopped justifying. But a bigger part of me welcomed it, welcomed it because I could see this was a new conversation. And he stopped using the word we and he started talking about I and I feel and he'd moved from his head to his heart and he's asking now about my dad and he wants to know the impact on me and he's asking what kind of man he was and I can see that for him he's now seeing my dad as a human being and that when he planted that bomb he he wouldn't have seen anyone in that building it was just a strategy and that is the nature of violence right? And so he's realizing that just as he accused the other of demonizing them, which was true, he also has lost some of his humanity for using violence and he's demonized the other. And he would say that he was disarmed by my empathy. And if I'd gone in there shouting at him and arguing, he would have stayed in a very safe place of righteousness. And as he knows more about my dad, he's beginning to feel the impact of what he did. And there's another hour and a half. So we've now been together three hours and I've reached my limit. So I'm, as I'm being present to him, I'm also listening to myself. And I knew I'd re I couldn't, I couldn't be there anymore. And yeah. I said to him, I'm, I thanked him. So I'm going to, I'm going to go now. And he said, I'm really sorry. I killed your dad. Now I didn't go for the apology because uh, what would an apology mean to me? But what I got from that was his acknowledgement of my dad as a human being. And I said to him, I'm so glad it's you, which is a very strange thing to say. And the second time we met, he asked me what I meant. What I meant was, 
I don't think many would have opened up at that moment. Not many would have engaged on the level that he engaged, and made himself so vulnerable. And, you know, 20 years on, I still feel that. I feel that his courage to open up at that point to seeing and feeling the impact of what he did. And his journey, I think is a very, very hard one, but that's his journey. Anyway, after that first meeting, I felt very disoriented, like I'd broken a taboo of society. I'd met my enemy and I'd seen his humanity. And all I wanted to do was go back for a second meeting. And he apparently went to a library that weekend in Dublin to find a book on what, what do you feel when you meet the daughter of someone you killed, of which, of course, there is no book. But he was disorientated as well. So we met for a second time um, a few weeks later and someone um, who was a friend of Anne said, can, we, can I come and film it? It's purely for recreation project in Belfast. It's never gonna go public. So we both agreed. And that second meeting became part of a BBC documentary a year later. And the people who made the BBC documentary were more than people making documentary. They were our support team. They were our friends. They were the people who gave us the space to have the conversations. And that, that year, it was an extraordinary year of having hours and hours sharing together. And I remember one day when he shared so deeply about what he'd experienced. And I thought, if I'd lived his life with everything he's been through, with what his grandparents went through, you know, would I have made the same choices? I don't know. And in that moment, there isn't anything to forget. And I've had that experience even with the ex-British soldier who went out there at 17, 18 and experienced what he experienced. I've had that experience with the um, ex-loyalist paramilitary. I've met the peace women and wondered about that. The RUC police, all different sides. And it really shows me that there are no sides, that having, having sides to a conflict is a, is a myth that um, is sort of created, but actually, if we put any of those people in different situations, then they might have made the same choices. And that to me is almost like a beyond forgiveness. I have problems with the word forgiveness these days. For me, it's about that empathy. And I think it was Patrick who first used the word disarmed by empathy, but empathy for me is actually what this work is about. And yeah. has become my, almost like my sort of the value that I, th I think can, can change the world. Because when I've empathized with the, let's say the ex-British soldier and heard what he's gone through and what, and what he's feeling now, then I would want for him or her, you know, the same level of support and have their needs met as I would my loved ones. When I hear the story from the loyalist community, when I hear the story from the IRA, I'm gonna want the same level of, support and peace and safety. And I've taken that understanding of empathy. Um, so I've, in the last 20 years, we've, we've shared our story together on platforms all over the world. And we've lost count 300, 400 times, I don't know. And I've also done a lot of work on my own. We went to um, Rwanda about eight years ago, I think, I don't know how long ago it was. And that was extraordinary. And it was an opportunity to hear people who were involved in the conflict. Now, I heard some stories from people who inflicted the violence as well as those who are victims. And even when I heard the stories of those who took part in the violence, who did the most appalling things, and they explained to me what happened in their process, how they got to a point of being able to kill their neighbor, I thought actually that I, I can understand. And it's so much easier to put, put it out there. They're the ones who can do the dreadful things. But I think all of us, given exceptional circumstances, can do terrible things to other people. And that happens because of demonization. Now, one of the first things Patrick said to me when we, we had a public, first public talk was in London, an amazing woman called Sida Elworthy, who I'm sure you all know of her work. We were given like three minutes each. <laughs> And Patrick said, I now know I, could, uh, I can sit down and have a cup of tea with Joe's dad. Now, 
I can imagine the two of them together, but the Conservative government don't have a policy of cups of tea. They didn't then and they don't now. And what is a cup of tea? To me, a cup of tea is about dignity, respect, listening, even when there's disagreement. You know, it's, it's being able to hear each other rather than going, I'm right, you're wrong. And, and right now that polarization is just getting more and more intense. It's even dividing families and communities in many, many different ways. And actually, I don't always agree with Patrick. You know, we have differences. He's he stayed true to, they had no other choices at that time. And I actually see that as a shared responsibility. And I think perhaps you'll understand that, that I think that if there had been interventions possible to him and his community, they would have taken it because they're not evil people. You know, they are just people like you and me, but they didn't feel they had that choice. And what could the British government have done? What, what could have happened for them to feel there were other choices? And I'm, I absolutely know that there could have been. Now we can't change the past, obviously, but what can we learn to change the future? And I do believe that if people have, um, people, people don't even know they have choices. People don't even know that. But if people know there's other, other ways they can be heard, other ways they can get their human rights protected, other ways to feel safe, then they will take them. I think the process of, of going from, can I actually use violence is a very, very difficult one. And I think the recovery from using violence is very, very hard. So the young me wouldn't have understood about peace in that way, but now it's totally about how can we change so that I think the process for soldiers to go to war and the legacy they have when they come back and there's some amazing people, veterans for peace I'm involved in who speak out about that level of, of recovery they need to go through. You know, it's just not worth it. And I personally believe that if we use violence to resolve conflict and even one person is killed, it's too many, it's too much. And Patra would say if he was here that, it's okay for um, people to speak out against war, but there are people like his community who had no voice, they're the marginalized. And he said, but he sees people who have the power, they use violence very, very quickly. And then judge those like his community that don't, and they're called the terrorists. And my dream very much is for us to change our foreign policy. And that's where I'm with you all to stop using violence. And I do believe there will come a time where will look back and you know be taught in school over oh, the olden days when they believed that violence would resolve conflict. To me, it's completely, I, I understand how people get there because it's the way of forcing change. But to me, the way of creating change, I didn't force Patrick to change. He changed because he chose to. So it's sustainable. And that to me is how, how we create change in the world. And I really believe from my work in restorative process and my work around the world that when people give them the opportunities, you know, and they feel safe and they're held and validated, then they're far more likely to change than the way of forcing people to change. And um, what the British government just said to Northern Irish people yesterday is to me just appalling, appalling, appalling. And the victims now in Northern Ireland are just, They've gone back in their trauma. There is, it's, there's people speaking out. It's absolutely appalling. The British government again decides that they're going to do something to the people of Northern Ireland. There's no consultation. They've ignored the promises they've made because they've actually been, there was a massive consultation. Um, the Stormont House Agreement going to be this, like their own truth and recovery, focusing on um, information recovery rather than than justice and storytelling and it was going to be a way to actually honor the past and give something to the victims um, and it was going to be trauma aware and now it's all just gone with the government saying we're not going to do anything with no consultation in fact going against what has been decided so there's violence to me on many many levels and going back to the last um, 20 years well no it's longer than that since 84 since my father was killed I I've been learning a lot about my own violence, my own capacity for violence and how to recover when I've hurt people. But I've also been learning about how we can, how we can listen to people we disagree without making people wrong or right, without blaming people, without demonizing people. And I obviously would rather my father hadn't been killed, 
but I'm grateful for the opportunities that I have. Even two days ago, I got a, an email and I spoke to someone from Lebanon who's created an organization called Fighters for Peace. And she's asked me to speak, and now we're doing everything virtually, obviously, to the women in Iraq, the Yazidi women, who've all been victims in so many ways, and to do a workshop with them. You know, and that is just such an honor to be able to have that opportunity. Excuse me. <coughs> it used to be that I saw the healing between these islands of the island we're on now and then and then Ireland north and the Republic. But now to me it's the world. And I feel that there's a shared responsibility of when people use violence anywhere in the world of any of the wars. And my dedication is as rest of I don't know how long I'm gonna live, we don't know do we but as long as I have I'm still dedicating my life to creating peace. And my story has given me a way of having doors open, has given me opportunities. And a lot of what I do is moving from speaker to facilitator, but the story gives me credibility. And I've been in a lot of schools in um, Tower Hamlets where I now have a reputation. It's all, all word of mouth because of the work I've been doing. And I've had um, young black men, um, Muslim girls speak up about the trauma that they go through, the racial injustice, the hatred the, that they feel demonized. And I've been blessed to hear their stories and to listen to them and to really acknowledge that they have a voice, that they matter. And some of the feedback I've had is that for the first time they've been listened to by a white person, which is shocking. You know, it's the first time anyone's ever said that they have a voice and they have a part to play in being a change maker in the world. And they've said that their, their anger and their sense of injustice, which they feel is now something they're working to be a positive change maker. Um, all I've done is listen and valued them and validated them. I mean, that's such a gift. And I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't been people listening to me. So now I'm, I'm passing it on. And I see all young people as positive change makers. I see all of them. Um, I think they have a very hard time. And especially now, I've since COVID, I've actually been back in schools in Tower Hamlets working with 13, 14 year old girls who all gone through trauma. And when we get to sort of the project part, I never say to them, I think this is what you need to do. I'm saying, look, we're talking about kindness and resilience and we're talking about um, ways that they can feel better. I do a lot of self-talk because I find that the messages that they can tell themselves can be quite negative. So we do a lot of work on self-empathy. And then I, I'm going to find about how do you, what, what do you want to do now? And they've created these amazing projects of kindness and resilience. And when I was with them, they were making these beautiful badges of messages and their faces just lit up and they were giving them to teachers and giving them to other people in school. And like the ripple effect of just them giving out is just so wonderful. So I mean, that's not that's not work that's gonna ever, you know, it's not changing all in a massive way. But to me, that's really important that just be able to go into a school and pass on those just a very simple that they matter and they can do something. Um, so I've talked a lot, I can carry on talking about some of the work I've done in different parts of the world. And I mean, I've, I've been in Palestine and Israel and Lebanon and Mexico, Australia, um, obviously all over Europe. You, uh, I think from those slides, that I, I was in Dresden and I met some women there who would have been 10 when we bombed Dresden. And they shared their stories. It was literally a 10 hour sharing of stories. And I remember them, it was all translated that there were no men left in Dresden. There was just them and their mums. And they talked about just the relentless bombing that just went on and on and on. And those stories are so important because um, that's not how history's taught, it, is it, to us. But they, they were incredibly strong and amazingly beautiful women. And there was there's someone there who was the, he's probably not alive now, but he was the oldest survivor of Guernica from Spain and he ran the Peace Museum in Guernica. He was there. 
and not other victims of terrorism from different parts of Europe, just storytelling, you know, and, and just so, so important. And in Rwanda, we went to the Kachacha courts, which is their own restorative processes. And that was incredibly powerful. I think for me, there's a real sense now that like humanity is healing together. It can't just be our group. We all have to do it together. And then when you bring in all the challenges that we're having of climate change and COVID, we need to work together as a global family. And even things like making sure that the vaccine is open to everyone in the world is just so important, you know, and, you know, I just love the, the British government. If you've got any ideas of how we can do this for them to, to bring some more empathy and, and understanding that actually, you know, we all need to work together. It can't just be about the needs of one community. But let me stop talking now. And is anything you can ask me or respond to then? Um, I can talk about what I went. I actually spoke in the Houses of Commons if you're interested as well. But I'm just going to let stop now because you've all been so attentive. Um, and we've got another half hour, haven't we, Karen? So any any questions? You've been. I think you can either just come off mute. Is that right, Karen? Or have you, are there any questions in the chat? Whatever. We we haven't got any questions in the chat, but as, as Karen uh, said earlier, you're, you're welcome to use the chat. Alternatively, you can put your hand up physically or using the, the chat the chat function to do so. Um, so please don't be shy. I'm sure you're burning with questions. So um, who's got a question? And hi, Maggie, I've just seen you're here. <laughs> Karen, do you, do you have a question? <laughs> Myself. Jem has, he's got his hand up. Jem, go first, I think. Hello, <laughs> um, thanks, Joe. It was a really interesting talk. Um, my question was just your uh, remarks about the British government and what they've decided to do in Northern Ireland. Um, what, how would you have liked the the process of restorative justice to have continued in Northern Ireland rather than it being uh, stopped suddenly as the British government has done. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jen. So it's all there, they've done the work. There are amazing people like Brandon Hamber who was involved in the South African Truth and Reconciliation. He's a professor in Derry. Um, he, on his website, he's got all the different the different times when they've been working on different groups, different organizations. And um, if you're on Twitter, he's just um, said some really powerful words about what needs to happen. And it was already there. So there's a real sense of betrayal because the British government did agree that they, they would, they would, it was in July of 2019. Um, and now they, they're just kind of like given up. So, and it was, it was their process, you know, it, had, it has to come from the people. We can't impose that on people. It's come from consultation with the victims. It's come from people who understand about trauma, people who understand about the complications of justice. So it's, it's well thought out, incredible piece of work. It's all there. So it's just being completely abandoned. And um, uh, it's very sad. And it's very sad be also because, um, you know, since Brexit, obviously things are things are difficult there because you know, the, the government seemed to forget we had a board. <laughs> so it's um yeah, it's very very sad. I've been asked to um, do some radio, and but some of you might have heard Brandon Hamber. He was on Radio Four this morning. I don't know. Um, and I don't know. I couldn't do it today, I've been too busy. I might do it tomorrow, but only because I will speak for those in Northern Ireland who aren't being asked. You know, I will use some of their names and quotes and make sure that I um, have conveying their voices because that's what, that's what needs to be heard. But I see it as a form of betrayal. Donald. Yes, well, 
Uh, what an enlightening talk that was. Uh, I was a conscientious objector in the Second World War, and uh, my feeling has always been that in most conflicts organized by countries and governments, one is encouraged not to think of the people in the enemy's country as human beings. The propaganda before, for instance, the World War II was completely lumping all Germans as being evil and so on. Now, at the end of the war, I, as, as some people know, I, I worked in the French Relief Service, but perhaps leaving that, in our town we had a prison of war camp, a German prison of war camp, and uh, a group of pacifists and the conscientious objectors in the area decided that there had to be some form of reconciliation. So we arranged to go in, and I think we we're the first, first people to group to go in, into a, a German prison of war camp. And of course, you soon realize that when you got in there, that they're just the same sort of people as we are. Uh, they've all got their individual problems, very similar to our problems and so on. And treating them as individuals and as human beings, we managed to get a relationship which worked very well. Uh, correspondence was con continued after the war because they went back to a Germ Germany in a terrible condition of, of hunger and all, all the other sort of problems. But uh, I wondered, Joe, how, how would you uh, have thought of dealing with the situation in for instance, World War Two. I'm always told it's the, it was the good war, of course, which there isn't such a thing. Uh, but I, I just wondered, uh, with your methods, which is so good and which I believe in and have tried to live through my life, uh, I'm oh. just wondering how you would deal with the, that situation. Oh, Donald, that's so moving. And like your experience needs to be, like everyone needs to hear it. And you're so right about that demonization that's there. Like that's what happened in Rwanda. It's, it's always there, always is. And that when you finally meet people, you discover you, you're you very similar. Yeah. As human beings, we always have more in common, always. So I, I love, love your story. And it's, it's very moving and thank you. I, I'm, I sense that you've been, doing this amazing standing up for peace all your life and I'm sure at times when you're going against what other people think it must have been hard because I think what you were saying after second world war is not in line with many English people like I mean it's um, most English people would have believed that you know all Germans are bad and um, I mean it's still around now isn't it which is so shocking so thank you Donald but yeah no totally that's I mean, it's just so sad that recognition has to happen after a war, after that much damage. Absolutely. And I'm yeah. I'm not a great historian, but I imagine there are ways it, it all could have been avoided. You know, we didn't need to, I don't know. I, I, no, I just believe that we need to always try. There were a lot of untruths told before the war, which... Yeah the media carried through, as they do today, with so many different situations. But, uh, anyway, thanks very much. It's been such a, an inspiring talk. Uh, it, it was, uh, I understand the principles, but I never heard, heard it expressed quite so well. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm going to, if you've written anything about your experiences, I'd love to read it. Um, and, you know, maybe as something that I could share when I'm with my young people. The whole idea about reconciliation that's been around such a long time. Um, mm -hmm. I do share stories from other countries, like I bring in Palestinians and Israelis, but I think it also would be good to share your experience. So mm -hmm. I shall find, I'm sure you've written, you must have written things. Is that right, Donald? 
Well, I've not written a book or anything. I've, I've talked at various meetings and so on and uh, written short pieces. Yeah, I'll find it. And so on, but I, I haven't got to the stage. I'm not, I'm not a writer as such, really, unfortunately, because there's a lot of experiences which that's sort of being put down in words, but whether I've got time now in my life, I'm 96 now, so well, you never know. Anyway, you know, thank, thank you. Very much. Donald has spoken wonderfully at one of our previous webinars. Uh, ah, I can find it's it. It's available on YouTube, and uh, yeah, uh, Ian, you, you've got a question. Yeah, thanks, Joyce. Thanks, for, thanks for your talk. Um, what I'm interested in is. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the interactions you've had with MPs over the years? And then I wondered if you, uh, seeing your dad was a Tory MP, have you had, uh, has that endured to some links with, with, with Tory MPs? Or, um, yeah, you, you sort of, I mean, the present government has sort of, uh, I don't, I mean, many Tories, even Tory MPs now say that they, that they increasingly, it doesn't represent them. Um, so I wondered if there's any Tory MPs over the years who you think have had a better understanding of the process that uh, that, uh, that we would agree would you know needs to be gone through. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think so. So I mean, you won't be surprised to know because when I went public, I felt I had to communicate to everyone who'd been affected by Brighton and wrote letters and I wrote to Norman Tebbit um, and I've still got his letters well, I got yes I got his letter back to me and and he he very much um, is totally against he'd be totally I mean he wouldn't surprise you all is totally against what I've done and and he's um, he said it in the media time after time um, and the letter's not not very friendly you know it's it's very very angry which is you know I understand that's absolutely fine and then um, I did a um, I did, did a, the Moral Maze Radio Four, which I hadn't realised what a difficult program it was. And anyway, I met Michael Portillo was doing it, and Michael Portillo Portillo took over from my dad as MP um, in, in Southgate. So I actually met him because we'd um, we'd managed to I think it was um, in like the main park in, in Enfield. We planted a tree, which later actually did die. But anyway. But it was there as like kind of a public thing and he was there for the photo opportunity. So when I met Michael Portillo, he he said to me, Joe, I um I really can't support what you've done. I don't agree because I lost friends that day in Brighton. And I'm like, OK, what can you say to that? That's fine. And anyway, then about three years later, he asked me to take part in a program of his secret history or something he was doing. And, and obviously he's not an MP anymore in Brighton, he wanted to meet me in the Grand Hotel. So I said to the producer, I'm a bit surprised because I don't think he likes me very much. <laughs> Are you sure he wants me? Oh yeah, yeah, I know. He specially asked for you. So I'm like, okay, I'll go. So I went to Brighton and the first thing he did was, well, not the first thing, but halfway through, he, 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 had, he actually started crying. He went, I'm so sorry. I had, things have happened to me now. I understand what you've done um, and I'm on my journey and I understand and I'm sorry for what I said before. Um, and it was it was real. You can't fake that. You know, you can't. It was definitely he had a change of heart. And I don't know what happened, but he was completely understanding it. And then there was a we did a Radio 4 reunion program and there was I can't remember who it was, but there was a there was a Tory MP there who started off by not looking at Patrick McGee because he was in the studio and then eventually did. I'd have to Google it to find out who it was. I mean, I would say no. You know, like, I don't think there are many that were around at that time who would support me. Michael Heseltine, who was a friend of my father's, we, had, we did a memorial. There was a plaque put up in the House of Chambers and he, he stayed away from me and, and did not shake my hand. Um, and like, he would have known me as a child. But the, the, at that time, the, who was it who was the Speaker of the House of Commons till recently? Um, he's gone now. The one before the one who's now, what's his name? John Burko. Yeah. He came up to me and said, 
I've been reading all about you and you have my complete support. So that was a surprise. But no, I, I, I don't think in the Conservative Party that, that there are many who would um, give me support for what I've done. Is the answer, that's a long answer to that. So yeah, no, none, none that would be my fans, which is all right. But that when I spoke at the House of Commons, it was on the all party um, group on conflict issues, which actually doesn't exist anymore. But like some of those all parliamentary parties are like can be quite you know interesting because they feel free to kind of not not so much the party line. And that was that was amazing experience of um, speaking in those walls, which, as you know, they're just imbued with like the old way of doing things. And and I was there talking about peace and resolving conflicts no one gets hurt and everything I believe in and there was one MP who walked out because he was so angry Patrick McGee was there but others did stay and that was an extraordinary experience of um, being back in those walls because to me the House of Commons was where I went as a child to meet my dad you know we we, had, we went there to see him because he was so busy he was very dedicated to his work and we go there to um meet him to eat supper and um and then to be back there actually speaking my truth was was amazing but yeah no i don't think i've got many fans in the conservative party anything else i'd love to know what what do you think is the biggest challenge we, we have at the moment to change how we resolve conflict, how we understand conflict and how we can bring peace? What do you think is the, the hardest challenge that we, we have right now? Anyone? Because I, th I think it's almost like... In a way, there's more people who feel like we do, but then there's also the stronger voices, and they're the ones that sort of seem to have the power at the moment. Donald, you came off mic. Did you want to say something? You're muted now. You're muted, Donald. You're still on mute, Donald. Sorry, I was going. Uh, I don't know how much uh, you heard, but uh, uh, nothing. My, when I'm, oh, well, sorry about that. I thought I'd unmuted, but one of the biggest problems I think is occurring at the moment is the increasing militarization in the country. I mean, the last statement about increasing military expenditure and uh, the in increased number of nuclear warheads and so on, and children are being approached in schools. We're the only country in Europe that uh, gets 16 to 18 years into the military. Uh, 18 is the minimum age in the rest of Europe. And the development of all sorts of military aspects which are conducive to the principles that you've been expressing, I'm afraid, and uh, particularly in, in education, I think uh, in Wales, I mean, in Wales, as you see, we're trying to form a peace education system already in parts of mm. Wales, in mid Wales, it's already in process and it's working very well. We're trying to spread it through other parts of Wales. It's a slow process, but I think if children are educated in considering individuals and you know the humanity and so on in the life and sort of the reconciliation, even in school problems and things like that. If the, if they get this sort of education, then it may spread through the country and there's a possibility of then achieving uh, some progress in this way. But uh, 
I, I'm a little, it's going so slowly. And uh, I obviously wanted it, something to be positive before I, I also left, left this world. And, uh, and it, it is happening so slowly, but it is going on with uh, several a couple of groups in Wales who are, uh, Wales has always been a little bit more of a peaceful yeah. nature and consequently, you know, uh, I think we in Wales anyway, we may have greater success than possibly in many parts of England, but uh, I, I think, as I said, I think I, I'm afraid that the increased militarization isn't helping the situation uh, in the reconciliation world. But, uh, right, oh, well, thank you for sharing that. I've heard amazing things that are happening in Wales, um, all sorts of different projects, so thank you. And we have a hand up from Stephen. Yeah, good evening. Also uh, speaking from Wales and um, uh, and like you, a great admirer of Donald, perhaps not quite as much of an optimist uh, as he is on uh, how far ahead we are in Wales. But uh, there are interesting things uh, on the cards. Um, I'm sure this cross section of us this evening um, all listen probably a little too much to BBC Radio 4. Um, and I'd just like to, to throw in something which I heard earlier this week on uh, a half hour program called The Patch, which uh, some of you may be aware of, uh, a random postcode generator and the producer and the presenter go to any part of uh, these islands and try and find a story. And this one happened to end up in Kent with a, um, a soldier who... Uh, served in Northern Ireland in the early 1970s. And uh, his story perhaps doesn't perfectly tally at all with what you've said this evening, Joe, and what those of us, uh, how we approach these issues. But I, I thought it was quite telling in that uh, he too, as a result of uh, what he experienced in Northern Ireland, uh, has had terrible mental health problems. And in the last uh, 10 years or so, the way he's tried to help dealing with that is um, finding out uh, the sites of graves in the Kent area of former service people and cleaning them, in particular those for whom there are no descendants or nobody looks after the graves. Now, um, it's different styles and different strokes for different people. But I, I think uh, if that is a way for that particular individual to resolve uh, some of the terrible uh, things that he personally clearly has had to cope with following his experiences, then um, at least personally, I feel there is positivity even in the gestures that he feels are important to him uh, even though they're specific to other people who've served in the forces, uh, some of whom died whilst actively serving in the forces. Um, yeah, and it's just a, another example of uh, the myriad ways in which uh, we as, as human beings can make potentially small gestures which are, are important based on our own life's experiences. Gosh, thank you for sharing that. That's that's very moving. I'm going to look up the program, and um, I, the lack of mental health support, as we know for everyone, but but for veterans is is shocking how little there is. I I know the Wales are, are far more trauma aware than we are in England, and um, so they've got amazing programs going on. But it's lovely that he found a way to to turn what he'd been through into something that he could then care for others. And I think it's called post, post-traumatic post growth. It's like when people turn something around like that and that that's a lovely story. And of course he's a victim of the troubles 
you know, just just as much as as everyone else is. I I, I just think it's you know it's wicked to send our our young men and women at seventeen. Like they were, you know, he the stories I've heard of why people joined the army and went to Northern Ireland and what they experienced and the the whole veterans for peace um, of the, there was um, a group of men and they represented seven decades of war and they came to Northern Ireland and me and Patrick spoke with them and they're, they're, all their stories are just heartbreaking and what, what couple of them have been in Iraq and and the the way they'd all been manipulated and the process that that they were being brutalized their own humanity in order to be able to do the work i mean it's just to do the violence just absolutely appalling so that's lovely you know i just believe there's so many stories and i love it when people get an opportunity to share because um his story I'm, it's fantastic that someone took time to hear his story and then it was broadcast out um we need to hear these stories still. so thank you I remember when I had someone on the radio, I was like a Radio 5 thing and people were just ringing up. And I had a I had an ex-British soldier just furious with me, absolutely furious, you know, just just so cross that I'd met Patrick McGee and I'd become his friend and I was working with him and I like just incensed with anger. Um, and of course, probably the radio producer was like, oh, this, this is exciting. You know, we've got a fight going on now. And, and I heard through the anger, um, I could sense his story through the anger. So I, I just took a deep breath and I said, at 18, it must have been so scary to be in Northern Ireland and not knowing who was around a tree, who was around the corner, that potential you were going to be hurt at any moment. That must have been so scary when you were seven, 18. And he completely stopped. He stopped being angry. He went, well, yes. And then he started sharing the story of what he'd been through. And and then of course we connected because like I could go, wow, that, you know, that's that was really scary. And what support have you had? And you know, and he he forgot that he was there to to tell me I was wrong. Because of course his his story was completely, you know, valid. But if I had responded on the anger, then I wouldn't have got to hear that. So I'm so pleased that I managed to go a little bit deeper into what was behind the anger. And it would have been terrifying for those 17, 18 year olds in, in Northern Ireland and not prepared for it at all, let alone going to Iraq, but we won't go there. But we, we know what, a little bit of what they've experienced there. So. Yes. How are we doing for time, Karen? We have time for any more questions or? Yeah, we've got we've got time. I think, I think Karen wants to ask a question as well. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. I mean, there's been many times during the discussion that you know that feeling where you a feeling goes down your back, where you you're feeling really connected with other human beings in a special way. And that, I've had that several times today. And, and I remember I actually read your story for the first time online a few years ago. I, I, I wasn't listening to you speak online, but I remember then that I. I, 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 I was just incredibly infected emotionally and physically. I almost couldn't move for a while. I just needed to sit very still because it, it took me, literally took me beyond what I thought was, was humanly possible. That, that, that's part, that it, was, it was shock that, 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 that your story was possible because I'd read, I had read about people doing restorative justice thing and with a lot of preparation meeting meeting someone for the first time meeting someone but the continuing to meet that that's what I couldn't get my the, the sort of the opening, opening up, up to the other person to that degree and and he, hearing a little bit how how that happened was 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 just incredibly moving that it, it seemed that it happened in increments and you didn't make the decision all in a big way at the, the beginning about how long it would continue or, <laughs> but, but thank you. Um, and I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about your work with groups in Palestine and Israel. I don't know, you, you mentioned. Yes, and, oh, well, thank you. Thank you for your, for your understanding. You know, one of the, 
think the most amazing things that I've heard was when I was in Sarajevo, I'll come back to your question, uh, speaking at an international peace conference and people there from all around the world. And at any time there were like 10 or 20 workshops people would go to. And me and Patrick would put on uh, the, like if there's sort of, the, there was like the deluxe place for the workshop. And then there was like the place which is like literally in the corner of a building. And that's where Patrick and I were, okay? So we were seen as people, but no one wanted to go there. But turned out a lot of people did. So we were literally just in the like a basement and people were having to stand up. And anyway, we did we did our workshop and there was a Mexican man there. And as we know, Mexico is like having a war there because the amount of violence is just horrendous. Anyway, he wrote to me the next day and he said, I now know what's possible. I'm going to take what's possible to every meeting that I go and every talk that I go, because now I know what's possible. And I think that that meant so much to me that it was he was taking he changed his his view. And I think that's what you're saying, Karen. And that most makes me feel really happy about, wow, that's what this can do. Um, and then he actually invited me and Patrick to come and speak in Mexico. And it took took like five years, but he did organize it. But sadly, um, Patrick McGee was not allowed to be there because the American government still have him down as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And he actually went to Colombia and tried to go to Mexico that way because he was being told he couldn't go through American airspace. So he thought we worked out he could go to Colombia and then it doesn't go through American airspace. But the Mexican Mexicans were told not to allow him in. So he got as far as Mexico City and he was treated as an absolute criminal um, and then sent back to Colombia and then back to Spain. So he never he never went never got there. It was so sad because apart from doing a massive talk, we were doing loads and loads of work with some of the victims of the violence there and students and a lot of kind of very much grassroots work. But the first talk was a was a, um, a 10,000 10, people audience. And um, because he couldn't come, I decided to do it with, with two chairs on the stage. And I said, this chair is for my dad who can't be here because he was killed in a terrorist act. And this chair is for the man who, who killed him. He can't come, even though he's been dedicated his life to peace building with me because he's still seen as a terrorist. And I want them both to be on the stage with me as I give my talk. So that was very powerful. So anyway, the Palestine in Israel is one of the first projects where I actually got the funding to do that. And it was like it came out of I'd already met people from the from the parents circle, which I'm sure you've all heard of the amazing people who've all been bereaved, Palestinians, Israelis who work together. And also I'd met people from Combatants for Peace. I'd met other people. Um, and so I, I put together a program. And what I didn't realize you know, it's impossible to know was how difficult, how long it took to cross from Israel to Palestine in the checkpoint. So I had this crazy trip where literally we were like, oh my God, hours and hours getting to places and, and it was exhausting, um, but it was amazing. And the first talk we gave was in Jerusalem. And as you know, even having um, Palestinians and Israelis meeting in the same place can be difficult. And there's like one place in Jerusalem, which is sort of a hotel that's kind of known for this to happen. I can't remember the name now. And it was Combatants for Peace was our first talk. And the Palestinians arrived all flustered and, and frazzled because they'd had such a hard time to get there. They'd been stopped by the Israeli checkpoints. And it gave me a real sense of just how these people did not live in peacetime, you know, the daily challenges they had. And I remember thinking it was me and Patrick spoke what are we doing here? You know, like, why are we here? Even though we've been asked, I, I kind of doubted myself. And one of the questions after we, we spoke was that someone said to us, so what's your answers for us? What, what should we do? And both Patrick and I went, we're, we're experts in our own story and our own experience. We have no answers for you. We're here to listen and support you, but we don't have the answers. Of course, if we had given any answers, they would all would have jumped on us completely <laughs> like, for, for daring to give an answer. And then one of the people said, you coming here has given us two things. One is you've shown that you you care and you, you're bringing your love and you care and that means a lot to us. And secondly, you've allowed us to see our conflict mirrored back in a different way so we can now see ourselves differently. And I, it kind of made complete sense to me. So the hardest place for me to go is Northern Ireland. I've had a riot when I spoke at East Belfast, right? Because the triggers are so great. But, but, the, but Israel and Palestine were, were not the triggers. 
So they had, they actually had a conversation amongst themselves of us listening in a different way, because there was a safety there, there was a connection there that was happening. So they had a very powerful conversation. And some of them met us another time in, in Warrington in England. And it was one of the times where Patrick and I ended up not speaking for three months. It was really difficult. And they loved the fact that we were struggling. You know, they were so excited. Oh my God, Pat and Joe are having problems. That makes it better for ourselves because we have problems. And I go, well, of course we have problems. This is massively huge emotional work. This is so difficult. So just little things like that. Anyway, after that, we met the parent circle. One of my peace heroes, I was actually speaking with him on Zoom the other day, Bassam Aramin, who is in Palestine. And he, he helped found combatants for peace. And, and then he, he lost his daughter. She was killed and she was 10 by an Israeli soldier. And he then became involved with parent circle. And then he, he got a Rotary Fellowship to travel to Bradford, where he did his peace studies there. The amazing, amazing place. And he did his thesis on what the Jews experienced in the Holocaust. Can you believe that? And with that empathy, he takes that back to the Palestinians so they can understand what happened to the Jews in the war. I mean, this, this man's heart is like, you know, whenever I start being sorry for myself or think life's difficult, which, you know, I can do. <laughs> I just think of him and we are in touch. And, and recently we shared a platform together and I just think, wow, that amount of empathy and compassion. And he has a, an Israeli brother um, who he lost Rami, I can't remember his surname, but I can find it for you. He lost his um, daughter to a Palestinian um, combatant. And the two of them, the, the love they have, and when I, quite often I go into my schools, just in case the boys start thinking this is a female thing, you know, what I've done. I always have a picture of the two men together with their arms around each other. And I go, actually, this is a human thing. There's these two men, they both lost their daughters and their daughters were killed by the other person's community. And yet they're talking about shared humanity, not demonizing each other. They're talking about what, what connects them and their pain is the same. You know, and that, that just really, really touches me. Um, and Robbie Damlin, who lost her son, she's an Israeli. One of the first things she said after her son was killed, you know, no more violence, not in my name, straight away, because she knew it'd be fueled up as a political thing. And she was like, no, no, what, what makes people straight away feel that like I did, you know, or my friends in America who lost their son in 9-11 um, and the next day they were out with their placard saying, not in my name, will you go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan? And, and we knew that's what happened, but they knew straight away that their, their pain of their son would be used to go to war, you know, and I don't know what makes people do that straight away, but that was always my view. I wouldn't want anyone else to go through what I went through, and that's what some people feel. And other people, they want to use their pain for, you know, revenge. But for me, it's about ending that cycle of, of revenge and violence and not wanting anyone on the planet to go through it. And we know that they do. Every day people are killed. So. so that's a long answer to the question. And I want to get back. I'd love to go back to Palestine and, and Israel. You know, I, I really empathized with the Israeli soldiers. You know, I really saw that, you know, they're at three or four years old. You know, they're not asked about university. They're all prepared to go into the military. Because when I went to university, I was like, how come they're so old? They're like 27, 28. Well, they go in the military, then they go to... Colombia or Thailand for recovery, and then they go to university, you know, and, and, you know, the chances are if we were born to Israeli family, we would, you know, of course, there are some Israelis who don't, who's, who have that strength and, and say no, and then they, some of them, as we know, go to prison, but the most do, because otherwise they're not going to have their jobs and what's their future, you know, that's, so it's, it's the system that's wrong, isn't it? It's not the individual, so. Any other questions or contributions?
Well, I'll just end. I think we're going to end, aren't we? By like, um, I, I put an admiration. If any, any of you ever can think of anything I could do to contribute to the work that you're doing, just you know, let let me know. So, these days, I'm online a lot of the time, so <laughs> very available. <laughs> But other than that, I'd give my support and love to all the work that you're all doing. And thank you so much for listening to me today. Thank you so much, Joe. That was amazing. It was really, really engrossing and thought provoking. Uh, so thank you. I'm just going to share. Um, I think Mary Lou wants to put her hand up. She wants to say something. Oh, no. I think it was a, okay, an accident. That was uh, a bit of applause. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and so, and Hilary Evans in the chat has, has said thank you so much, Joe, for such an inspiring talk. So, thank you so much. I'm just going to share the screen now, um, a few final slides. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so. Joe's charity Building Bridges for Peace is can, the website there on the Facebook page if you want to find out more information. Um, I'm sure there must be contact details on there as well, Joe. Um, so please do go check that out. Um, definitely worth, worth a visit. Um, and you can find out more about our webinars from our website. Um, we include information about upcoming webinars, but we also include information about previous ones, including links uh, to the video footage via YouTube. All of our previous webinars, I haven't counted how many there are, but there's several to choose from. Um, a wide range of topics, including Donald's one that we, we mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, so, and all of our information um, is on our website, including donations, et cetera. Um, so please do check that, that out and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. Um, and we will update you with, with our news on when we, uh, when we announce our next webinar, sorry. Um, and yeah, all that's left to say is thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll leave the, I'll leave the call open for a, a little bit longer. Um, so if you want to chat or, uh, anything final thoughts then you're more than welcome to uh share them there's no no rush to to kick you off so to speak so feel free to meet yourselves as, as well <laughs>